So the title of my talk is uh, Processing Billions of uh, Events in Real Time Using uh, uh, Twitter Heron. Uh, Heron is a, a new streaming engine that was open sourced by Twitter a couple of months ago. And uh, we use, have been using Heron for the last uh, two plus years in production within Twitter. And we thought we'll uh, open source it so that the community can benefit it. And I'm going to talk about uh, in detail about Heron and how Heron is used within Twitter context to process all those events. So my talk outline will be as follows. First, I'll give you a Heron overview. And uh, I introduce the concept of uh, micro streaming uh, in the context of Heron, how Heron differs from the lot of streaming engines out there in the open source. And uh, I will highlight a couple of uh, problems that we faced in production. So one of them is uh, stragglers. How do you deal with the slow machines and uh, variations in mission speed? And also, like I will give you some kind of performance numbers, how Heron performs in uh, production and where the time actually is going when you write a, a streaming job. And finally, I will uh, give some ideas about uh, if you're interested in uh, contributions. So the, then uh, followed by, I'll do some summarize the conclusions. So what, uh, why we do, do real time? So Twitter is all about real time. And uh, there are several aspects of Twitter which is real time. So the few of them include real time trends. So we continuously keep computing trends and bubble up those uh, uh, emerging trends out of the Twitter feed. Then real time conversation during sporting events like uh, Super Bowl or even any football game or soccer or Olympics, a lot of uh, chatter goes on about a particular way of uh, uh, taking a touchdown versus uh, uh, calling a uh, umpire or uh, criticizing an umpire call. So those kind of conversation has to be bubbled up as well in real time. Then uh, since our monetization strategy is based on ads, uh, when as these real-time conversations are flowing through those uh, Twitter feed, we need to take advantage of what conversation is relevant to inject the relevant ad to the conversation so that the likelihood of uh, the ad being clicked increases. And finally, we also do real-time search where the tweets that are coming in into the system are indexed very quickly within a, uh, hundreds of milliseconds so that the results of search at twitter.com can be very current. So, so analyzing all these billions of views in, in real time is always a challenge for us. And uh, we have been using a, a previous first generation streaming system called Storm. How many of you know about Storm? Okay, so we have been using Storm for a, a while, for the last, uh, from 2011 to um, 2014 or so. And uh, so we ran into a lot of issues when we were running at scale, especially uh, running streaming at a few thousand nodes. It's a big challenge. And uh, so Storm ran into a lot of problems in terms of uh, task isolations, debugging, performance tuning, and they're not able to sustain the GCs, all kind of issues that we have and which we summarized in a paper that we published uh, last year in Sigmod. There were totally, we identified 19 problems. So that's when uh, we decided to uh, go after writing Heron so that uh, we can solve all those problems. So I'm not going to go into details of the storm problems, but I'm just going to delve into Heron itself. So, so like just to give an idea about the Heron topo terminologies, a Heron job is uh, called a topology. It's essentially like nothing but a DAG, and uh, the DAG consists of vertices and uh, edges, and the vertices represents the computation, and the edges represents streams of data flowing from uh, one vertex to the other vertex. So there are two different types of vertexes, and uh, this one of them is called spouts. They represent the source of data for the job, and uh, it can tap into any sources. It could be either a Kafka or a Kestrel, or even a MySQL, Postgres, or even any other data source that you uh, uh, consider as pertinent. For example, you can, if you have a way to uh, tap a data from a kernel uh, um, counters, you can even write a spout on your own and uh, deploy the topologies. So the second uh, type of vertices is called bowls. The bowls are essentially your uh, uh, computational elements where they take the incoming data, process them in a certain way, and they emit the outgoing tuples. And some of the examples include uh, uh, filtering, aggregations, joining, as well as some kind of a machine learning arbitrary functions like clustering, association rule mining, and all the various stuff. So the Heron topology looks like the follows. As I said, it's a DAG. And you have a, a, a couple of spouts in this DAG, which in turn feeds to the next stage bowls. And uh, those bowls process the data and feed to the, uh, the second stage bowls. Uh, to give a concrete example, take the word count topology. 
And uh, so in this case, you have a, uh, we are trying to count the distinct number of words that are occurring in the Twitter stream. So take, uh, so in, uh, in order to accomplish that, we need a tweet spout. And that tweet spout is essentially tapping into the stream and getting those tweets out. Then uh, we need a parse tweet bolt, which takes those raw tweets and breaks them up into distinct words. And finally, you have a word count bolt, which in turn counts the distinct words across the streets. And uh, in the uh, database kernel point of view, we call this as a more of a logical plan. So essentially, it describes how the computation and other things look like. But uh, it does is the, the same thing gets realized in physical plan, but not exactly. It gets realized when it executes in the physical hardware in a different way. The reason why we have to do it in a differently is because um, you, the sheer size of the data that you are processing, you may not be able to process within the context of a single machine or even within the context of a single process. So hence, uh, uh, when you, the topology runs on a physical machine, you have a lot of instances of each one of those components. So in other words, uh, oops. In other words, uh, uh, you have the tweet spout task, which might be run, uh, need to have 100 instances running to handle the brunt of the Twitter stream. Similarly, the parse tweet bolt, if it is taking, uh, uh, the parsing is costing some CPU, it might be having another 200 instances of the parse tweet bolt. Similarly, the word count might be doing another 50 instances of that. So those number, what we call this is a parallelism for each task, for each uh, vertices. And uh, once the parallelism is identified, which is a part of the tuning phase for a topology, then you launch the topology into the physical cluster. And uh, these individual spout tasks and bolt tasks are packaged and run in the single cluster. And uh, we will see more about how it is being packed and run uh, in the later slides. Now, one of the issues with this one is like uh, when a tweet uh, spout emits a tuple, where the tuple should end up in the downstream bolt. For example, in this case, the parse tweet bolt. So in order to accomplish that, there are a bunch of groupings that we have. And uh, some of them are what you call shuffle grouping. So which means you, if you, the tuple comes out and you can distribute to anybody. So which means you randomly pick any downstream bolts and send the tuple. The second one is like a fields grouping where you take one or more fields, hash based on those values, and throw into the appropriate task based on that. And uh, there is uh, another grouping called all grouping where you replicate to all the downstream bowls. And finally, there is a global grouping where it sends the entire stream to only one single task. And uh, often in practice, we have seen only a uh, combination of shuffle and fields grouping is what you use. So then coming back to the word count topology example, uh, what groupings that you will introduce? So in this case, you have to introduce a shuffle grouping because when that tweet comes out of the tweet spout, it doesn't matter where it lands up. As long as the tweet gets parsed, it doesn't matter where it lands up. So, it, so which means a shuffle grouping will be suff suffice in this case. On the other hand, when you go from a parse tweet bold to a word count bold, you need to send the same word to the same bold so that the count is accurate. So that's where the fields grouping comes in. So fields grouping directs based on the word to the appropriate task. So with this short terminologies, uh, now we wanted to see why Heron. So, so like, as I said, the Storm was one of the previous system that we used, and it had a lot of issues in terms of performance predictability. In other words, when multiple topologies were running uh, together, or the fragments of the topologies are mapped into a single machine, uh, one was racing, the other was slowing down, and uh, there was no clear control on how much resources that particular topology is supposed to use, and how to constrain that. And uh, that led to a lot of issues in terms of uh, one topology trampling over the other, and that lead to a lot of uh, troubleshooting and uh, pages that occur like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and uh, often uh, during events like Super Bowl and Oscars, where the traffic in Twitter is pretty high, you end up all kind of uh, issues of the trampling. So improve developer productivity. We want to get to a model where uh, the other teams uh, in Twitter they can write a Heron topology or a Storm topology, and they should be able to uh, debug themselves. And uh, Storm was very poor in that, especially with respect to the fact that uh, you can't uh, get the logs for a particular process while it's running properly. Then you cannot profile it to identify your performance problems. So those kind of uh, issues were there. And finally, like uh, ease of manageability. So Storm was uh, uh, what do you call um, 
uh, encouraging people to run in their own clusters. So, which means you have to manage a separate cluster for that, which has its own set of overhead in terms of uh, having uh, folks uh, maintaining the cluster and uh, making sure that cluster is healthy and all. When there is a big uh, cluster, which is maintained by already a, a team, and which we call as a compute cluster, which has hundreds of thousands of machines, and why can't you play nice and uh, work with the uh, same cluster in a multi-tenant fashion? So, so you wanted to make the ease of operations as easy as possible. So some of the design decisions we made up front was, uh, it has to be fully API compatible with Storm, because of obvious reasons, because Twitter had made a lot of investments in Storm and all the uh, topologies and all the business logic that has been running for a few years is uh, already written in Storm. So all we have to do is like, uh, if the API compatibility was possible, then uh, we just have to pull the Storm under the rug and put the new heron and the, so any compilation of topology should be without any changes and they should be launch it. So we, we have to make sure that it works. The second one is we wanted to make sure that uh, we can improve developer productivity by using task isolation and uh, uh, doing containers because uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, every task is uh, able to debug and profile and even uh, uh, say that this is the amount of resources that I need for this task and it doesn't take more than that amount of resources so that we can run in multi-tenant cluster. And finally, we wanted to use uh, mainstream languages like uh, C++, Java, and Python. I don't know how many of you have heard about it, but uh, the storm was written in a functional language called Clojure. And the uh, interaction of Clojure with JVM had its own set of issues in terms of triggering GCs, sustained GCs, all kind of issues were there. We wanted to kind of avoid all of them and stick with the tested and proven languages. So with this, uh, this thing, so like, uh, first of all, the, uh, the major addition that we made is we got away from a custom scheduler for Heron. So since uh, uh, Mesos uh, has a big community behind it, then uh, uh, Yawn has a big community behind it, and similarly, we have uh, managed schedulers like Mes uh, Aurora running on top of Mesos, similarly, Marathon running on top of Mesos. So we have these several schedulers already have, are running and uh, very stable. So we wanted to get away from the scheduler, and all we did in Heron is like, uh, uh, we just give a mapping to whatever the scheduler that you want to launch the uh, Heron jobs, and you should be able to ready to go. So that so a Heron job, a real-time job, it looks like a yet another job for a scheduler, except the fact that these are all not terminating jobs. They will be always running until you go and kill it. A streaming job is always running like a service. And uh, only when you kill it, the job uh, kind of uh, leaves its resources back to the scheduler. So then uh, in the case of Heron, you submit a topology to an existing scheduler and uh, it runs the topology alongside with other critical services in a multi-tenant cluster. So if you zoom in on the, how a topology architecture looks like, uh, whenever you launch a topology, uh, container zero comes up and uh, the container zero is uh, uh, contains a process called topology master and uh, the topology master is responsible for managing the entire topology. And uh, the, then uh, the, once the topology master comes up, the first order of business is to advertise where other people can find, uh, other fragments of the topology can find itself, find, the, find it. So it writes a, a, what you call the discoverable uh, host and the port into the Zookeeper cluster. Then it also identifies how much resources that topology requires. Hey, I need 100 containers and each container should be of size uh, like uh, four to five CPUs and also 10 GB per container. And once it determines the resource requirements, it contacts the scheduler, hey, I need this many containers of this much resources, can you please find them and spawn them? So once uh, uh, the scheduler uh, uh, gets those resources and spawns all of them, uh, so that is where the other containers that you see in the lower part of the slide. So those are all called the data containers, and those containers are spawned by the scheduler. The moment those uh, containers are spawned off, uh, a process called stream manager comes up on those containers, the first order of stream, uh, the stream manager is to figure out where my topology master is, where my master is running. So it uses the zookeeper discovery mechanism where the topology master has returned its location and discovers it. And once it discovers, it sends a message to topology master, hey, by the way, I'm up. And once uh, topology master gets uh, all the stream manager check-in, then it forms what you call as a physical plan. And a physical plan essentially allows you to uh, make the um, stream managers 
discover other stream managers in other containers so that the data can be exchanged in a fully connected graph fashion. And um, so the, uh, the stream manager, uh, uh, what do you call, once they check in with the topology master, topology master forms a physical plan and also writes a copy of the physical plan into the Zookeeper cluster. And uh, the reason why we do it is uh, the container zero can fail because at any given time it, it's, it's running in a machine on its own and uh, it will fail and the container might be re relocated to some other machine by the scheduler itself. So in that case, the topology master has to rediscover uh, where its data containers are and uh, uh, how they are running, whether they're healthy or not, right? So in order to do that, it has to uh, rediscover its state, the physical plan and all the various stuff. And uh, so that is why it saves those uh, state information when the topology master, uh, the container zero dies. So now what happens in the case of uh, uh, container, data containers death? So a scheduler will allocate a new container and automatically that container's first process will be stream ma manager. And again, it will try to find its topology master. And since all the stream managers and the containers are assigned unique IDs, uh, the topology master uh, will get this uh, new container reporting that I am the old container, whatever it used to be. Then topology master, since it is, has some kind of heartbeats coming from a stream manager, it knows that the containers, the old container has been dead, the new container has come up, and will reconstitute a new physical plan and send it down again so that uh, the data uh, exchange starts resuming again. So, so it's built for fault tolerancy where container deaths, process deaths, machine deaths, all the things are taken care of without any manual intervention at all. So if you look at like uh, how, uh, uh, oh, I forgot to mention in the previous slide that uh, a couple of other items. Um, sorry. So in addition to the stream manager, there are other processes that run on the container. And uh, the actual work is, the, remember the tweet spout and uh, uh, the word count bold. Those processes are run on these instances called I1, I2, I3 in purple color that you have seen on the slide. That is where the actual uh, uh, bolts and spouts run. And uh, uh, unlike Storm, where the spouts and bolts are running on a th threaded system, this is a, a completely a process-based system where individual um, spout task is run on process on its own. And that helped a lot in terms of uh, uh, debugging that process or doing a heap dump or even uh, uh, well, profiling those processes and it having stack trace and all the various cool tools that you can use with it, right? The second, uh, the other process, the metrics manager is responsible for collecting all the metrics that's happening or the number of tuples entering a particular process the number of tuples exiting a particular process and how much latency it experience in that, uh, ex during that execution. All of them are, pro data is collected by the metrics manager and it is, goes to an offline system as well as back to the topology master so that your UI can be served so that people can figure out what are the uh, current number of tuples that has been processed and any troubles that are occurring, all those stuff. So now if you look at how the physical execution happens, as you can see, there are four containers for this topology, and each one of them has a stream manager running. And uh, so after the physical plan is shared, they form uh, what do you call uh, some kind of a, a fully connected graph. So every stream manager is connected to other. There are two sockets that go from each stream manager. One is the control socket, and another one is the data socket, where data is exchanged. I will explain the need for a control socket a little bit later when we deal with stragglers. And as you can see, the instances are the process running in those containers, and the instances connect to the stream manager to send their data. And uh, even if there is a local exchange of data from S1 to B2 on the uh, top uh, left container, um, you will be bouncing off from the stream manager. That made the architecture simpler and more deterministic. So, so the topology master, as I said, uh, it's solely responsible for managing the entire topology and uh, it assigns the role and team and other people who launched it so that we can uh, aggregate capacity based on uh, what team is using, uh, how much capacity for her and jobs and all the various stuff. Then it also does monitoring in terms of especially the container health, uh, how the uh, stream managers and all the guys are working or not. Then finally, it also provides metrics which acts as a serving ground for the UI. Then the stream manager is essentially the heart of the entire processing uh, infrastructure. 
uh, it has routes the tuples. So whenever a tuple is uh, uh, injected into a stream manager, remember, depending upon the shuffle grouping or depending upon uh, your uh, uh, fields grouping, the tuple has to be routed to the appropriate container and within the container to the appropriate process in that container. So it does all of them. Now, it also manages what he calls a back pressure, especially if uh, one of the guys is going slow, how do you throttle the other guy so that everybody goes at the speed of this, uh, the same guy, so, or the slowest guy. Uh, so it deals with the back pressure. I think like uh, I will de uh, describe the back pressure a little bit later. And there is an act management which is useful for at least one semantics where when the data entered is guaranteed to be processed at least once. So now the Heron instance and where the actual work is really getting done, which is like, uh, it uh, has, runs only one task, as I mentioned, because for all the isolation purposes. Then also exposes the Storm API. You can write your own instance if you wanted to write your own API as well. So that way it is very extensible architecture. Then uh, it finally collects all the gathers of metrics and transports to uh, Topology Master. If you look at uh, Heron instance, um, so the data is coming from the, there is a couple of threads running within the uh, Heron instance, and one is called the get gateway thread, which is responsible for dealing with the, uh, the input output data from the stream manager. And similarly, like um, uh, gateway thread also deals with the sending metrics to the metrics manager as well that is collected. And your logic, where your, the spout logic or the bolt logic that you wrote will be running on your task execution thread. And the data from the gateway thread is pushed on a queue to a task execution set so that the, it picks it up, the task execution thread picks it up and runs it. And these queues are dynamically adjusted in size to minimize GCs so that, uh, um, that we don't uh, keep a lot of objects in, keeps in uh, hovering around in memory. So, so with, the, uh, with the short introduction to uh, Heron, then how Heron is deployed uh, at Twitter. So we need some bells and whistles in addition to the cool architecture. Um, so we have uh, something called a Heron tracker that tracks all the uh, jobs that are running uh, uh, using Heron. And also we have this uh, Heron web, which is the UI uh, for Heron. Then also the Viz essentially allows you to do an offline analysis of all the metrics that we collect for uh, a particular topology because uh, if some uh, troubleshooting needs to be occur, we need to look into those graphs and see what has uh, happened. And uh, so in, uh, we are, uh, by in production, we run it in uh, Meso slash Aurora and we use uh, Linux C group containers heavily and um, that worked out really well. And uh, some of the sample topologies range from uh, very simple to uh, what do you call uh, some complex topologies as you can see in the graphs. So as you can see, well, like uh, some simple topologies which has uh, like a four node topologies to something which has 50 nodes. And uh, some of the lower topologies that you see with complex topologies, they are all are not uh, handwritten, instead it's generated by higher level frameworks. And uh, you can even see some of the topologies where it's a disconnected uh, DAGs, like uh, there is no connection between them. That could be split up into multiple jobs, but people, uh, wanted to manage like less number of jobs means then they can write multiple topologies into one single topology as well. So, so remember I mentioned that the, the metrics manager collects a lot of metrics and uh, we have a dashboard that uh, allows us to troubleshoot any topology and the, some of the topology dashboard looks like this. I mean, this is just a one fraction of the whole dashboard. Uh, I can tell you like more than 200 metrics are being collected and all of the, you will be scrolling pages and pages before you can fig figure out what the right metric is. So, so officially, uh, in, uh, it has been in production for the last two years, and uh, I can't give out the numbers, but uh, it is processing large amount of data, and we run Heron on a few thousand nodes on a multi-tenant cluster. When I say few thousand nodes, it doesn't mean that uh, the node is dedicated completely for Heron, but uh, it's like uh, all containerized, and it's running on, uh, the Meso slash Aurora, which is the compute, big compute cluster that we have within Twitter. And uh, the equivalent of container equivalent of the number of machines that we use is a few thousand. So the Heron use cases within Twitter are like in, divided into huge uh, seven buckets. Um, so the first is the real time ETL, where uh, extract data, sorry, extract, transform, and loading of the data. 
and the real-time BI, so where the data is uh, uh, picked up from the, uh, when, as people are doing an engagement with Twitter, then uh, the, the, those data is picked up and uh, it's broken down into multiple dimensions and aggregated on those dimensions so that you can look at how, what the, how people are interacting with uh, Twitter at any given time. For example, uh, we have something called real-time active user interactions and uh, by uh, meaning that you could see uh, people using Twitter broken down by region, broken down by device, and broken down by what operating systems that they are, are uh, using, all of them in a real-time dashboard where you can get up to the second uh, kind of view on that. So we also use it for product safety in terms of fraud detections and uh, uh, abuse and tracking all of them. Then we also compute all the real-time trends. Then uh, uh, real-time model building as well as real-time model enhancement for data mining or uh, machine learning folks. And uh, we also process a lot of uh, images related, uh, image related features to classify images of, uh, that has uh, similar features together. And we also use it for real-time ops in the sense like since we have a lot of machines, data out of those machines are collected continuously in real time and uh, we process those data to identify which machine is going bad or going slow and even do some kind of prediction when that machine has to be replaced at any given time. So there is lots and lots of use cases that we use it for. Um, so now I'm going to uh, uh, go a little bit, uh, zoom in on a couple of uh, 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 issues that are the highlights of Heron itself. And so one of them is uh, what you call the componentizing Heron. So um, in the current uh, world, the systems are, uh, a lot of systems are continuously, new systems come into play and the uh, old systems are continuously evolving. For example, in the case of scheduler itself, we have unmanaged scheduler, which is Yawn and Mesos, unmanaged schedulers like Aurora, Kubernetes, then uh, Amazon EC2, uh, Docker Container Service, then Marathon, and God knows, like even HPC community has that uh, one scheduler called Slurm Scheduler. So there's a bunch of these schedulers uh, keep coming up and going away. And uh, similarly, state management and synchronizations that can be like Zookeeper, or you can even use a local file system if you're writing in a single uh, node. And even Hadoop could be used uh, in uh, some way, some kind of a uh, state manager as well. And uh, when you upload your jar, you can upload to uh, even S3 if you're going to execute in an Amazon environment, or even a Hadoop if it is in a dedicated cluster, or even local file system if it is a single node. So we wanted to coexist in this environment where the environment is constantly changing, but the core should keep the same because the core has been debugged and it's in production. We don't want to keep changing the core, but we should be able to adapt to a new environment. So, so we got a, uh, when we said like, how do we do, uh, uh, combine, uh, how do we tackle this problem? So we looked back in the history and we found microkernels. And I'm sure a lot of people here will know what microkernels is. We, the, one of the inspiration was the mock microkernel paper. So they went from a monolithic kernels to a microkernel where they kept only the essential services and uh, then the rest of the other services became a process on top of these essential services. And uh, that's what we followed in, um, in micro streaming. So where the basic streaming requirements is an IPC communications. So essentially like uh, how to transfer data from between process and how to transfer data across process. Uh, processes in uh, different systems. Uh, so that is one of the basic requirements. The second one is like uh, a scheduler abstraction where uh, if you want to fit it into any scheduler environment, how do you do it? Uh, similarly, a distributed state uh, uh, management where you have to store the physical plan and all the various uh, other uh, uh, synchronization mechanisms, an uh, interface for that. So once we have that, then all the process and, and protocols, once it's established, it becomes already componentized. For example, in this case, Topology Master is a process that deals with the user's IPC to interact with stream manager instance and all the various folks. And it also interacts with the scheduler and the state manager whenever uh, it needs to use that services. And similarly, like the stream manager also is a return as a process. So you can go and replace anything as long as you can, uh, um, what do you call, uh, satisfies the protocol of uh, transferring data, receiving data, and processing those appropriate control messages. So that's all we need. So this gave a great advantage for us because uh, um, when we deployed Heron into production within uh, Meso slash Aurora, and when we open sourced a couple of months ago, 
people ask for can we run it on can we run it on a, for a hpc comedian i have on a slurm scale or can we run it on marathon you know on a dc os so people have been asking all these things and uh, we were able to turn it around quickly within less than 2 weeks for every scheduler so now currently it runs on uh, native mesos as well as uh, marathon as well as uh, slurm as well as yawn and uh, of course uh, mesos and error and we also have a local scheduler which allows you to bring everything into a single laptop and continuously run it uh, within the local laptop in a single laptop so that you can do development and all the various stuff so quickly we are able to uh, map these schedulers as fast as you can and uh, similarly like uh, this architecture also allowed to support uh, python uh, uh, topologies i mean uh, the initially when we started we were supporting only uh, writing java topologies now uh, we just finished the uh, you can write the topologies in python itself because python is such a um, nice language for uh, speeding up development but of course performance will be a little bit slow but uh, still you can um, uh, write your topologies in python and it runs on a native python interpreter itself unlike storm where it will be uh, going through jvm from jvm then there is a multi lang protocol which is uh, essentially spitting it out in json that goes into a python process no more complexities of that all we did is that instance instead of java instances you do python instances so we wrote that python instances and when you launch the python topologies it knows that it's a python topology has been launched it spawns up only the python instances so and uh, there has been already request for people want to write in c++ because they want to have legacy code and all the various things and uh, that's in the works as well so any new lipstick or any new api you can go and do it very easily um another project that we are working on is uh, sql on heron itself and that also will have its own sql instances which in turn does all the aggregations and other sql operators that can be efficiently implemented so that all so this gives or the whole point is this architecture gives the flexibility to do a lot of uh, um plug and play kind of components so as i said like uh, the microstream engine gives you an advantage of uh, plug and play components as environment changes code does not change then uh, multi language instances uh, supports multiple language as i said python and c++ and multiple processing semantics so we can even replace a stream manager for high speed for example let us say like uh, all seed folks come in and say i wanted to have a even lower latency than what heron provides yes we can write a stream manager that can directly work with um, an infini band which has a low latency and so you will be ready to go without having to change any of them at the top so the ease of development because of the fact that it is componentized multiple teams can work on independent things and it gives a faster development iteration for us as well so today the heron runs within twitter context local scheduler this our development environment and uh, for uh, testing and everything we use mesos/aurora and zookeeper and htfs for uploading stuff um then uh, for production we use uh, aurora scheduler zookeeper state manager then packer which manages the versioning of uh, all the topologies and all the various stuff and um, and uh, in the open source it does run on uh, several other schedulers as well and uh, so i'm i'm going to highlight uh, one uh, production uh, um on operations uh, experience this is called the stragglers and how the uh, we deal with it um so stragglers essentially are uh, you know are the norm in a multi tenant distributed systems so one of the there are three primary reasons why stragglers occur uh, one is a bad host which is essentially it's not a failed host it's a bad host uh, in the sense like it is um, processing slower than what it should be doing and also the execution skew uh, in the case of uh, uh, some process hitting a uh, uh, a highly popular key and twitter is known for it for example uh, so if some popular tweets uh, get retweeted everywhere then uh, the same tweet will be hit the same process and uh, the sheer size of the data that is getting into that process the process cannot handle it and that could be the reason for a straggler as well then uh, the third reason is you might not have adequately provisioned resources for the job itself so let us see how we are, uh, take the approaches to handle stragglers so there are multiple approaches uh, one is simply say uh, senders to stragglers if i am sending a data to a straggler i just i i can't send as fast as i am getting data i'll simply drop it the second uh, strategy is to hey like um, uh, the straggler is not receiving as fast as uh, i'm sending the data but so i will slow it slow it down so that uh, i can go at the pace of this uh, straggler itself the third one is how to detect stragglers and reschedule them 
proactively. So if you look at the drop data strategy, uh, one of the problem is it's unpredictable. I mean, in the whole DAG, in the distributed environment, it's possible that uh, somebody is dropping data somewhere without having visibility, so which means it's affect accuracy quite a bit. And there has been instances, uh, this is the data uh, strategy that uh, Storm adopted, and they found out that uh, um, uh, we found out that uh, some of the data that we were sharing were 2x, 3x inaccurate. So that was uh, the reason why we did not adopt this strategy itself. So instead, we did a slowdown center strategy where uh, it, this one provides predictability because uh, everybody goes at the pace of the straggler, and uh, the whole data consumption rate might go down, and that in turn uh, translates into a lag in the source itself. So it can process the data at the maximum rate when it recovers and also reduces recovery times as fast as it can and nicely handles spikes because Twitter is known for spikes, especially during uh, Super Bowl and all the various stuff or even uh, during gaming events. Whenever a touchdown occurs, you see a 3x, 4x spike which will die down in a couple of seconds. So, so in the slowdown center strategy, let us take the example of a, a topology which is linear in the sense like uh, we have a spout one followed by a, a bolt B2 and followed by a bolt B3 and it again goes to bolt B4. And uh, so let's take this uh, same, uh, the physical realization of the topology with the containers and all the steam managers connected to each other. Now let us say B2 is a straggler in this case. Uh, so the steam manager on that container will detect hey, by the way, the B2 is going slow, uh, so I need to do something about it. So instead, so what it does is the stream manager uh, sends a, what you call an initiate back pressure message to all, broadcast the message to all the stream managers. And uh, the stream managers uh, look at in their physical plan whether in their container any spout is running. Because ultimately, the spouts are the gatekeepers of injecting data into the topology. If we can slow down those spouts, then automatically the stragglers will be allowed to drain uh, the data in, a, in a whatever pace that they want. So, so once a stream manager receives those uh, initiate back pressure message, the spouts are all uh, completely disabled in the sense like no more data is taken by the stream manager into a, uh, from the spout. It's essentially like uh, the stream manager is returned using the uh, lib event, uh, event loop. And all we do is just uh, take the socket out of the uh, uh, spout and then we don't consume. So automatically the spout slows, slows down. And um, so then once, um, once the back pressure is, uh, or the straggler uh, is able to process back to its normal rate, then uh, it will, uh, we will send another relief back pressure message to all the stream managers and automatically everybody will uh, open up the spouts and start processing again. Now this kind of behavior could lead to what you call a initiate back pressure, relieve back pressure, some kind of a, a flip flop flop mechanisms. And in order to alleviate that, what we do is stream managers have this notion of uh, buffers, and uh, those buffers uh, essentially have this uh, low watermark as well as high watermark. And whenever you go beyond high watermark, we initiate the back pressure, and when you go below a low watermark, you need to relieve the back pressure. So that uh, those buffers essentially act as a cushion. So, that's what we did, and uh, in practice, uh, there, uh, for example, in this case, if one of these containers goes into back pressure, then what happens is like uh, you start deviating from in the source when you're reading the data from the source, like either a, a Kafka queue or a distributed log, um, your read will start lagging and the write will keep going because the data is coming at a faster rate and you're not able to keep up with the data. And this is what we call as a lag. And this lag is continuously measured for every topology so that you know at any given time, hey, this uh, topology is lagging, which means there is a straggler in that. And uh, so then we can manually restart the container if needs to be. So it, uh, there are a couple of uh, things. In most of the scenarios, back pressure recovers in the sense like for doing spikes and everything, it automatically recovers without any manual intervention. But there are cases where um, there are sustained back pressure because uh, this is because of irrecoverable uh, GC cycles, because especially if the topology is riding to some external systems for their output, and it leads to some kind of uh, GCs because the external systems are behaving differently. And, uh, or alternately, it could be a faulty host, which is constantly triggering back pressure all the time. And uh, in these cases, we have a hook where you can manually restart a particular container, and automatically that container will be restarted, 
and um, the, it will start processing. Uh, the, the scheduler will relocate the container and automatically uh, redo all the physical plan and everything and restarts it. Then uh, sometimes what happens is uh, people will say that, uh, hey, by the way, I'm lagging so behind, and uh, which means uh, my real-time liveliness of the data is lost. So I will just drop. I don't mind dropping uh, the data uh, and move to the top of the queue. So which means uh, we provide some kind of a sampling mechanisms or a, a drop uh, mechanism at the spout level. So it constantly measures how far I am lagging. And when there is a lag, boom, it's just um, apply some, uh, uh, what do you call it, some kind of rules and go back to the top of the queue itself. So detecting bad and faulty hosts. I mean, so see, we, since the, the bad and faulty hosts can influence the topologies quite a bit, uh, we often uh, uh, have to proactively keep detecting these fault, uh, hosts. So if you have these large set of uh, hosts, then what we do is like we r run another topology uh, that continuously collects data from these machines and uh, looks at how fast that machine is going on depending upon those uh, metrics that are collected. Then um, we uh, blacklist into the scheduler saying that, by the way, please uh, take these nodes out of the scheduling uh, mechanic, uh, scheduling consideration for scheduling, sorry. So then it automatically will remove it and uh, continues to kind of uh, keep the cluster sane enough. So then uh, finally, I'm going to give some performance numbers and, uh, okay. So finally, I'm going to give some performance numbers and everything. So here, uh, the heron, I mean, one of the things that we want to understand is uh, how um, the resources are being used in a heron topology. So in this uh, example, we have uh, 60 to 100 million tuples uh, uh, per minute being injected into this topology. And uh, a filtering step occurs within the spout itself where it filters the 60 to 100 million to 8 to 12 million. And after that, there is a, a what you call a blow up operation happens where each tuple is split up into five, five X number of times into 40 to 60 million tuples that come out of the spout itself. Then we give it to a next stage bolt which aggregates those spouts, uh, the tuples every one second and the outputs to a Redis uh, uh, cache by uh, 25 to 42 million per minute. And uh, these are the uh, codes that we asked and requested from the scheduler. So for Redis, it's a dedicated machine, which is 24 cores. And uh, uh, the number of cores actually were used to do two to four, and the memory used was about 48 and um, uh, gig. On the other hand, with the Heron, which is running on the Aurora cluster, then the cores that we request is 120, but the actual usage, depending upon the traffic, is around 30 to 50 cores, and the memory used is 200 and uh, requested is 200 GB, but actually used is 180. Now, where does the cores are being split, I mean used? So as you can see, 85% of the whole cores were given to spouts themselves. And uh, the bolts hardly take 9%, and Heron over it is hardly 7%. And uh, so like we were so surprised to see why spouts are taking more, uh, so much of the core resources. So when we profile the spouts, again, this profiling is all possible because of the uh, task isolation and other things that we did. Um, we found out that uh, the deserialization cost takes 63% of the whole uh, time. Serialization, deserialization. And the Kafka fetching takes another 25% of the time uh, for the 16 plus 7%. And uh, then uh, the, some of the other things like parse filter and uh, the user logic takes the remaining amount of time. And uh, so that is the bulk of the, when you profile bowls, um, the writing data into Redis takes uh, the chunk of the time when you go the, across the boundaries. Uh, but other than that, uh, the rest of them are, again, serialization, which is the dominating cause. So in the overall whole, uh, this thing, you can see 61% of the whole uh, resources are, are dedicated to fetching data from other systems, and especially deserializing it. And the user logic takes, uh, 21% and writing data is it takes 8% and Heron takes 11%. I mean, there's room to improve the Heron to even make it half of it, like 5% or even like 4%. But uh, the other things have to be improved before we can improve Heron itself. So to give some kind of uh, numbers in terms of throughput and all the various stuff, you can see the uh, real-time active topology, which is one of the close to production topology where we uh, run uh, there's some logic to figure out how the users are interacting with Twitter at any given time. And uh, so 
So we can, from this one, we can see that the number of resources cons uh, consumed is uh, hardly more than 10x. It's like 370 cores uh, in Storm, whereas in Heron, we consumed only 30 or 40 cores, which is 10x reduction in resources. That's a huge deal, especially if you're saving a few hundred submissions. And similarly, the no acknowledgement case, which is essentially like uh, the best effort. Again, uh, number of cores used is much lower in Heron. And uh, this is with respect to word count topology and the one example that I showed you guys. And uh, this is the worst case for uh, any streaming system because streaming system is measured in terms of how fast the data movement can be done. And again, like uh, we said, like we can do like uh, 10x in higher in throughput. And similarly, like uh, latency also is much lower. So, so if you are interested in learning more, we have published three papers and uh, you can look into that. We have a few more papers that is uh, coming out. Uh, and then if we, we did a tutorial on real-time analytics, that's a 300 plus slides, which has a lot of information about uh, uh, how, what are the systems out there and what are the pros and cons and all of them. So it captures all of them. So, so then uh, Heron is open source. If you're interested in contributing, please feel free to do it. And you can follow us at Heron Streaming. Uh, it's a Twitter account and you can get the latest updates from there. If you're interested in some contributions, these are the active projects that you're interested in. So we are working on auto-scaling. If there is uh, something that you're interested in, reach out to us. And uh, then we are using machine learning to identify the root cost detection in Heron so that we can effectively troubleshoot them. Then, uh, then open versus closed streaming systems care about the latest data. Then um, sampling and dropping, how effectively you can do then tuning, then uh, even C++ topologies. So a bunch of stuff like that is going on. Um, so that's all I had. If you have any questions, yeah. So. Yes. Yes, so that is the scaling of the topology project that I mentioned at the end, right? So we have already a prototype working where the uh, decisions of uh, uh, changing the parallelism uh, can be done manually and uh, given as a command, what you call as a, like a Heron submit where you submit a job, there's a Heron update where you can update a job with a different number of instances. And uh, so once you have the instances, automatically new containers will be grabbed and uh, the, uh, the whatever the increase in the parallelism and other things will be scheduled in those containers. And the rest of the physical plan, again, will be rejiggered. Then uh, the topology will keep running. Yes. It's possible in just a few more weeks. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, So a spout is essentially like, uh, depends on how do you write the spout. You can write any spout, any code in your spout by yourself. So we do a lot of, uh, within uh, Twitter context, we, have a, we also maintain the spouts because spouts is a very common thing that everybody wants to link with. So we have this uh, uh, distributed log spout, which is essentially our messaging system because we don't use Kafka anymore within Twitter. And we have a, used to have a Kafka spout also. Those spouts used to have a lot of logic in terms of whatever you mentioned. Sometimes we have some kind of a little bit queuing and a few things that we can adjust so that even if we get the data out of them, uh, we can keep the data around within the spout's memory and we inject the data. For example, some kind of rate limiting that we also can do from a spout to bolt as well, yes. And um, we are going to um, modify the Storm Kafka spout to take advantage of uh, some of the stuff that we learned and we will push those things into the Heron repo as well, okay? So like uh, currently like uh, there is a, uh, uh, currently like uh, we will inject, uh, we'll inform the scheduler team, hey, by the way, like uh, these machines are not working very well and all, then they will white blacklist into that scheduler thing, right? And that's where it's going on. But you, what we wanted to do is like, we want to get to a fact where the streaming job when it's continuously running, it's able to identify what machine is faulty and uh, automatically switch the container or probably kill the container and move on to the next one so that um, we should not 
get, because by the time the whole manual process takes, it's probably a couple of hours, so which means the real-time liveliness of the data is lost by then, right? So we wanted to do it automatically by itself. Okay. Thank you.